Thank you, Dr. Shreeja. Yeah, I think uh, it's not only that Madam has just given that brief CV, but uh, she has to her credit lot of she has written lot of chapters on immunization in various books. Madam has written a book on immunization applications in immunization. So what I know about her is the way she makes difficult topics very simple with lot of clarity and her uh, YouTube videos are wonderful where uh, she explains small and difficult topics and makes uh, clear. Thank you, Dr. Shija, for uh, being here and helping our students. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Good evening, everyone. So uh, first of all, I thank Dr. Nagarata and the White Army team for this opportunity. So straight away, I'll go to the topic itself. So, so what we discussed today is immunization in the context of postgraduates, right? But I think it applies to everyone. So what we need to know that it's not possible to really cover the whole of immunization in say 45 minutes or one hour. So what I plan to really stick on to is we would discuss recent changes in the IAP schedule. What are the newer vaccines addition in the national schedule? Any change regarding WHO guidelines and also some of the special situations. As students, we need to know that immunization questions are asked not only during VIVA and OSCE, even when you have your case discussions, naturally it gets deviated to that way also. So with that, let us see, first of all, what are the recent changes in IAP schedule? So mainly IAP has come with four vaccines, some changes, that is polio, typhoid, influenza, and rabies vaccine. Regarding polio vaccine, we all are aware about the national schedule where it is mainly bivalent OPV with two doses of fractional IPV. When it comes to the IAP schedule, IAP has only birth dose of OPV. Rest every schedule, all the doses are standalone IPV vaccines, not necessarily standalone, but it's only IPV. There's no addition of OPV there. And what is new here? The new is IAP has now added a dose at five years. So you have an additional IPV at five years of age. So the first question is why IPV at five years? IPV at five years because by the age of five years, it's not 100% zero protection. The zero protection drops, especially for type one and type two. And that is why IAP is recommending a booster dose at five years so that the next five years also you are 100%, near 100% protected against all the three serotypes. Now, why is OPV given at birth still? And what would be your catch-up immunization as far as a nine-month-old child is considered? Or what would be your advice to a 14-year-old adolescent visiting a country with an outbreak? What is VDPV and how to prevent it? So these would be some of the questions we would be answering. So the first one, why is OPV at birth? Remember, when you're giving OPV at birth, the baby is still protected by the maternal antibody. So the chance of getting VAP is negligible. And most importantly, this is a very important priming dose because it has been shown that when you're giving OPV and subsequently you're following it up, either OPV or IPV, the zero conversion rates are higher. And even when you're using only IPV for subsequent schedules, if you have primed with an OPV, there is a better mucosal immunity. So these are the three reasons why OPV is still recommended by IAP at birth. Now, is there any change in recommendation as far as WHO is considered? Yes, WHO has now come with a 2021 recommendation that every country must uh, try to introduce a second dose of IPV. Remember, in 2016, when we introduced the IPV, there are two options. Either you can give fractional dose of IPV at six and 14 weeks, or you can give a second dose of IPV at 14 weeks alone. So now there is no more that. That means you are not going to give single dose of IPV for every country. It is two doses of IPV, either as a fractional dose or as a IM dose. So two doses are mandatory because single dose is just acting as a priming dose. It is not giving you protection, anticipated protection, especially against type two. Because if you remember in 2016, when we did the switch, there were only four countries they were reporting polio cases, that is including VDPV and wild polio. But now in 2020, we had 27 countries reporting polio cases. And unfortunately, majority were VDPV. And VDPV cases have increased from 5 to 1,233. So that is an important take-home message to understand that when we withdrew the OPV, 
And when we give just a single dose of IPV, we are not achieving the target. And now the VDPV predominantly type two, but you can see both type one and type three is also being reported. So what exactly is VDPV? VDPV is a vaccine virus which has circulated in the community for long enough to regain its neurovirulence as well as transmissibility. So you need to understand VDPV will emerge only if the vaccine virus is able to circulate in the community for a long time. Remember about the COVID. Initially, COVID, you didn't have any mutations. And once it started mutating after, say, six months, one year, you then started having alpha, beta, theta, every type. So same thing happens with polio vaccine virus also. The longer it circulates, the more chance of developing a VDPV. And 97% of VDPVs are type 2. We don't talk about VAP. Why we don't talk about VAP? Because VAP is a vaccine virus which has mutated just enough to cause a neurovirulence. So it can cause a disease either in the recipient or in the contact. It does not spread in the community like VDPV. So VDPV is a real threat just like a wild polio virus. And once it is formed, it remains in circulation for years. That is what now we understood. How do you prevent? The most important way of preventing VDPV is to strengthen routine immunization. Whether you're using OPV or a combined OPV, IPV or IPV schedule, routine immunization has to be strengthened so that the vaccine virus cannot multiply in the gut of the vaccine recipients and mutate. Second dose of IPV is mandatory and you have another important introduction that is novel OPV2. It can come as a short note also that is NOPV2. What is this thing? This is a monovalent OPV which has been which is not yet completely introduced. Its main advantage is that it is more genetically stable. So it is assumed that unlike the other OPV2, this will not mutate to form a PDPV. And subsequently, naturally, phasing out of OPV is important. So these are the measures of VDPV prevention. Now, why is India still continuing with OPV? The answer is here again, note what is written. Your NFHS5 data says complete immunization is 76%. Previously, you had 62%. So now we have improved further. Now it is 76%. But 76% is not enough. When you have 76%, that means large amount, large number of your population is still partially immunized or unimmunized. And India is high risk for importation and outbreak. So it is important that the population has enough mucosal immunity to prevent resurgence of VDPVs, at least against type 1 and type 3. And that is why we are continuing with OPV. But once we get our routine immunization above 90 to 95%, naturally, we would be facing out OPV. And now coming to the next two questions. That is, first question was, what is your immunization advice regarding polio vaccination in an unimmunized nine-month-old child? So baby, nine-month-old child, what is your advice regarding polio vaccination? How many doses of IPV at what interval would you recommend? The answer is two doses of IPV at four weeks interval. Remember, two doses of IPV at eight weeks interval would give you a better seroconversion. But since we are seeing so many countries having type 2 outbreaks, that is why WHO now recommends that anybody comes late after having not received the doses of IPV, it's better you give two doses of IPV at least four weeks interval. As early as possible, you want to have the protection. Now the question is, an adolescent is going to a country with an outbreak of VDP. And as I already said, 27 countries are reporting VDPVs. So it won't be rare that you are not going to a country which is not having a, which is having an outbreak. So for that question to answer, the most rational thinking would be, what is the upper age limit of, OP, of polio vaccine? As far as India is considered, the upper age limit is five years. In US, the upper age limit is 18 years. But what would be the recommendation for travelers? The recommendation is if you are unimmunized, that means you have not taken any childhood polio vaccines or IPV, then you need to take three doses of IPV at zero, one, six months. Always remember, almost all the vaccine schedules, skilled vaccine schedules are like this, right? Your HPV vaccine, your hepatitis B vaccine, your TT vaccine, if you're taking late, the schedule is zero, one, six, where zero and one acts as the priming dose and the six month dose acts as the booster dose. And if you are previously vaccinated, that means you have taken polio vaccine up to five years of age. And now at 12 or 14 years, this is the situation, what would you do? 
you just require a single dose of IPV. So that is applicable for adults also. If you're traveling to a polio endemic country or traveling to somewhere where there is an outbreak, you need to take a single dose of IPV if not taken a polio vaccine in the last 12 months. So that much was regarding polio vaccine. Now we move on to the second vaccine, that is the typhoid vaccine. So now IAP recommends that typhoid vaccine needs to be given at nine months of age. So why is it introduced? Is single dose enough? Which vaccine to select? Why is it introduced? Because we all know that India is endemic for typhoid. That's not the only reason. The typhoid drug resistance is also increasing. So two reasons why typhoid vaccine is recommended by the, uh, by the IAP. Another reason is till now, we just had a polysaccharide typhoid vaccine. Polysaccharide vaccines, remember, they stimulate only the B lymphocytes and they produce limited amounts of antibodies. They do not have memory cells. And so you need to revaccinate every three years. And the protective efficacy was only 70%. So that is why earlier we were not much in favor of recommending a typhoid vaccine. Safe food and drinking practices would be definitely better. That was the option. But now we have a conjugate vaccine. What is the advantage of conjugate vaccine? Conjugate vaccines are polysaccharide vaccines which are combined with the protein. Now these vaccines would be able to stimulate both B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. And when a T lymphocyte is stimulated, naturally memory cells are formed, larger amount of antibodies are formed, and you don't go have to go on repeating every three years. The protective efficacy is close to 95%. So that is the third indication. That is having a very good potent conjugate vaccine. That is why IAP is now recommending typhoid at nine months of age. Remember, it may be given as early as six months of age also. Now, what is your vaccine recommendation for a child who has previously received a polysaccharide vaccine? So what is, so that, is that enough? Or after three years, you are going to give a conjugate vaccine? The ACVIP says that if you have previously taken a polysaccharide vaccine, even then it is better to go for a conjugate vaccine four weeks later. And the conjugate vaccines, two strengths are available, five microgram and 25 microgram. And IAP mainly recommends the 25 microgram vaccines and not the five microgram vaccine for lack of um, long-term studies. So with that, we move to the next vaccine. What was that? Influenza vaccine. So what is new in the influenza vaccine? There are two things that have changed in the influenza vaccine. Now it is a universal dose. Remember earlier we used to have a pediatric influenza vaccine and an adult influenza vaccine. So up to three years, we used to give 0.25 ml. Beyond three years, we used to give 5 ml, but now 0.5 ml. So now most of the vaccine companies have made it universal dose. And all vaccines are now quadrivalent. Earlier it was trivalent. Now more, almost all vaccines have two influenza A and two influenza B. And remember, we start vaccinating for any baby above six months of age. Up till eight years, if you are receiving the vaccine the first time, you require two doses one month apart. Subsequently, you require a single dose. So this is something that you all knew. So now we need to know who uh, the influenza vaccine is not part of the national schedule. It is the IAP that is recommending. So whom is IAP recommending? IAP is recommending every child less than five years is better to take an influenza vaccine and also children with comorbidities. In fact, the government of India also recommends influenza vaccine for pregnancy as well as individuals with comorbidities. So that would include your asthma as well as patients with cerebral palsy. So which vaccine and when to give. So you need to know that in India, India, even though as a country is in the Northern Hemisphere, so ideally we should be using the Northern Hemisphere vaccine. That would be what the government of India site would tell you. But the fact remains that in India nowadays, both the Northern Hemisphere vaccine as well as the Southern Hemisphere vaccines are released. And whichever vaccine is available, the latest vaccine should be administered, preferably wherever you are staying, give it before the influenza season. And in India, the influenza season either coincides with the winter time or often more commonly it is with the monsoon. So just before the monsoon. So if you are in a state where the monsoon happens in June, July, then this is the time to give the SH vaccine, which is already available. So the SH vaccine 2020 is already there and that can be given. So I hope that is clear. So influenza vaccine, dose quadrivalent when to give. 
Now coming uh, to the next vaccine. So this we would take it as a, as a scenario. A five-year-old child had a class three dog bite. Child was given uh, TD as well as anti-rabies vaccine on uh, day zero. On day three, the child is brought for the second dose. So what are the questions? Write the further immunization schedule for this child. What would you do if the child gives history of a complete post-exposure prophylaxis two months back? What are the different types of rabies monoclonal antibodies available, their limitations and advantages? Write the current WHO anti-rabies immunization schedule. It looks like too many questions, but we will take one at a time. Okay. So first square problem, what is the problem? This is a category three bite. So you know, whenever if the question comes, any bite, what to do first? The first is naturally cleaning the wound, washing with 15 minutes with soap and water, and then applying a viricidal agent like a betadine or a, or, or a povidonidine or a alcohol. And then you go ahead and give rabies immunoglobulin as well as vaccine. So here in our scenario, but it is a category three bite, there has been no rabies immunoglobulin given, only the vaccine was given. So now what will you do? Can you give the rabies immunoglobulin now? Yes. Once you have started vaccination, up to seven days, you can give the rabies immunoglobulin. So best is on day zero itself, but if not given and you realize it later, you can give it up to seven days. Please do not give rabies immunoglobulin beyond seven days because it will interfere with vaccine's ability to induce an antibody. So it is important. That's only for the first seven days. And you can continue with the rest series. So here we have discussed an IM series. So that is why it is 0, 3, 7, 14, and 28. Now, what was the second one? That is monoclonal antibodies. So regarding monoclonal antibodies, you should know that monoclonal antibody main advantage is consistency because it is artificially being produced. So every batch will have this same efficacy, more rapid production capability you can produce in large quantity and no risk for blood borne pathogen transmission. And types, human monoclonal antibodies are of, uh, there are two types of mono, anti-rabies monoclonal antibodies, human monoclonal rabies antibody, as well as a cocktail of two murine antibodies, which bind to different sites on the rabies glycoprotein. So this, the second monoclonal antibody is especially useful because there may be some uh, in uh, cases of bat rabies where your initial mom, uh, the human monoclonal rabies may not, anti antibody may not be effective, but you should know that uh, as far as India is considered, any one of these can be used because we don't have bad rabies in India. And many antibodies under different phase, there are currently under different phases of trial. So you may be getting many antibodies. So what was new in whatever we discussed till now, the mainly that what I wanted to say is that the IAP now recommends, in fact, monoclonal antibodies over rabies immunoglobulin in the management of category three bite because it's consistent, no risk of blood drawn pathogen, efficacy is being proven. So that is why now IAP recommends uh, monoclonal antibodies over rabies immunoglobulin. Now, uh, that was the next question. That is, what would you do if the child gives history of a complete post-exposure prophylaxis two months back? It can be post or pre-exposure no vaccination if re-exposure occurs within three months of last complete pre or post exposure. That means once you complete a vaccination series, you are protected minimum for three months. If the exposure is happening after three months, you just need to give two doses, that is zero and three without rabies immunoglobulin. Hope that is clear. And now what is the current immunized rabies immunization schedule? So as far as DGCI is considered, as far as Government of India is considered, we have the same immunization schedule that we have been following till now. No change, absolutely. But WHO in 2018 has come out with a new schedule and IAP has endorsed that schedule. But still, we are not practicing that because DGCI has not approved the newer schedule. But for exam, the question might come, then you need to write. So that is why it is included here. So what is the difference? As simple as that that the last dose has been removed. That's the only difference between the newer WHO or IAP schedule and the previous schedule. That means if you have a post-exposure IM schedule, you don't have to take the day 28 vaccine. You would take a vaccine on 0, 3, 7, and a vaccine anytime between 14 to 28. So the last one is not needed according to the newer schedule. 
what about post exposure intradermal schedule here you know no right intradermal you give two doses each visit for 0 3 7 and intradermal you don't have a vaccine on day 14 so in the newer schedule you don't have a vaccine on day 28 also that means all you have is three doses on 0 3 and 7 and what about pre exposure so pre exposure whether it is intradermal or intramuscular it is only two doses that is 0 and 7 there is no dose on day 20 i hope that is clear so the newer who schedule has taken away the last dose but this particular schedule is not yet being practiced in india because dgci has not yet approved as far as the schedule is considered now from the iap newer changes we move on to national immunization schedule so this is the national immunization schedule so what do we have recent additions now rotavirus has been added and also pneumococcal conjugate vaccine has been added on 6 weeks 14 weeks and 9 months and another change is that now tt has been replaced by td so these have been the three recent changes in national immunization schedule so first taking up the rotavirus vaccine mentioned two absolute contraindications for the vaccine rotavirus vaccine recommendation for contacts of immunocompromised individuals remember there are two oral vaccines we are giving now that is rotavirus vaccine and opv opv we know that contacts of immunocompromised should not receive opv so what is the recommendation regarding rotavirus vaccine then write the rotavirus vaccine schedule according to iap as well as national immunization schedule so when it comes to absolute contraindication any vaccine you can write whenever that question comes and that anaphylaxis to a previous dose of the vaccine that is very common for all vaccine apart from that skid and intersusception is a contraindication so even abdominal surgeries <coughs> abdominal malformations are also taken but main two contraindications is previous history of intersusception and skid now <clears throat> what about contacts in fact if you have an immunosuppressed patient in the family even then the baby can receive the rotavirus vaccine only precaution you need to take is that all household members should wash their hands after changing the baby's diapers because rotavirus vaccine virus can be transmitted up to one month after administration so you have to take the precaution for at least one month remember even when you have an immunocompromised patient in your family taking an mmr or varicella or rotavirus are, is not a contraindication mmr or varicella vaccine viruses are not considered transmissible that is why it can be administered now <clears throat> write the vaccine schedule here you need to understand rotavirus vaccine in the national schedule is three doses that is 6 weeks 10 weeks 14 weeks here the first dose is always given along with penta whereas in iap depending on the brand it may be a two dose schedule or a three day schedule but iap categorically says that the first dose should be given before 15 weeks of age that's to be precise 14 weeks 6 days and the final dose should be given before 32 weeks of age this guideline comes because of the risk of intersusception that is there with rotavirus one in one lakh but a miniature increase definitely is there but there is a change regarding national immunization schedule the nia says that you can give the rotavirus up to one year of age that is with along with the first dose of penta so if you get an unimmunized child up to 1 year of age along with the first dose of penta you can give the first dose of rotavirus and if you have already given the first dose of rotavirus before 12 months of age you can complete the schedule in the second year also now why is there a difference between the iap recommendation and the national immunization schedule recommendation the reason is Uh, nis always looks at the population as a whole so more children in india die due to diarrhea than they die due to intersusception so that is why they are recommending the rotavirus up to 1 year of age in fact who recommends up to 2 years of age so that is why the catch up is continued even beyond 1 year whereas iap is more concerned about each individual patient each individual patient that is why they 
are worried about the interception and that is why the age limit. In exam, uh, one of the favorite questions that examiners often ask is what is the peculiarity of the rotavirus vaccine being used in the national immunization schedule or the rotavac? The interest comes because the va this vaccine especially contains the 116E neonatal strain that was isolated in AIMS. So that is an Indian vaccine. So, but you should know that in the national schedule, it is not only the rotavac that is being given, rotacil is also being used. That is the Serum Institute rotavaxin is also being used in the national immunization schedule. Now coming to some basics. VVM, this is always a short note. So what does, what does a VVM indicate? What does site of VVM indicate? What do I mean by that? You will find that the VVM, that, that sticker is placed at different sites in a uh, vaccine. So what does that indicate? What are the limitations of VVM? And what is the difference between the VVM in an OPV and a VVM in a hepatitis B? This you all know, the two stages of VVM, if the inner, dive, inner uh, square is lighter than the outer square or completely white, it can be used. If it is the same color or deeper, it should not be used, that you all know. Now, you should know that VVM does not indicate the potency of the vaccine, but it indicates the cumulative time and temperature exposure. Remember, it is an irreversible change in color. Keeping it back in the fridge is not going to bring down the color. It is irreversible. The color remains there. But there is a science behind where the VVM is stuck. If it's a liquid vaccine, which has an open vial policy, like your Pentavac vaccine, it is usually in the body of the vaccine. That means this vaccine can be reused up to one month if the temperature stability as well as um, your um, uh, some sterile precautions have been taken, then it can be used. So for open dose vial policy vaccines, the VVM is in the body. Whereas when you have freeze di uh, dried vaccines, for example, your, uh, you can have a BCG, multi-dose BCG ampule, or you can have a measles vaccine, an MMR vaccine. These vaccines will have VVM either in the flip off of the ampule or on the lid of the vaccine. What does that indicate? It indicates that before you open the vaccine, you need to know that how is the VVM. But once you have opened, there is no indication to re-see what is happening. So that has to be, that means these vaccines have to be discarded four hours from the beginning it has been opened. So that is why they are kept at the top. So I hope that is clear. Freeze-dried vaccines have the VVM at the lid, in the lid. And you should also know that it is not the same sticker you are going on affixing on all the vaccines. Depending on the temperature stability, you have different VVMs. So the least uh, temperature, st uh, temperature stable or highly labile vaccine like OPV and BCG gets the uh, VVM2. That is, measles also gets a VVM2, whereas the very stable vaccines like hepatitis B would get a VVM30. The number means, the 30 means that day to the end point at 37 degrees centigrade. So if the vaccine is kept at 37 degrees centigrade, the color would change on day 30. VVM2 means if the vaccine is kept at 37 degrees centigrade for two days, the color would change to the end point. So now a word about Mission Indra Thanish, because that is something that is often a question in the theory papers also. What is a Mission Indra Thanush? It is a special drive during specified months that is mainly targets pockets of low immunization coverage and hard to reach areas. And the target is especially children less than two years of age and pregnant ladies. The first time it was launched in December 2014. And after that, in 2017, you had the intensified mission in Dhanush, which was aiming at increasing the immunization coverage to more than 90 percentage by 2020. After that, you have had many intensified mission in Dhanush, and the latest is in 2022. That is why I included because February this year we have launching the intensified mission Indra Dhanush 4.0, which mainly targets children less than two years. Three rounds are planned and 416 districts are envisioned to be covered. So what is the strategy? So mission Indra Dhanush. So Indra Dhanush means seven colors. So it is usually done as a drive for seven days, excluding the holidays and the routine immunization days. And there are seven strategies, seven days, seven strategies. What are the strategies? Basically, for, as expected, you would be doing it for seven days. You would assess the gap, then provide training for all those who are involved going to implement the program, identify the beneficiaries by headcount. So you're really going very down to the micro planning. 
And then you are mobilizing the beneficiaries and vaccinate them through fixed centers, outreach centers, and even mobile vaccination teams. And last but not the least, monitoring, actionable monitoring. That is really looking into where you went wrong and how to improve further in the next round. So those are the strategies for mission in the third. Now coming to another uh, um, exam case. Most of the time you get a neurological case for exam. So child with developmental delay with seizure disorder on multiple anticonvulsants. What vaccines are specifically indicated for this child? Any contraindication or precaution. So you should know all routine vaccines should be given. Specifically, influenza and PCV should be given because these children cannot handle their secretions. So they are having respiratory infections are very high. So all routine vaccinations, including influenza and PCV. What would be your advice regarding DPT? This is a child with developmental delay with seizure disorder. It can be a cerebral palsy. It can be a neuroregressive disorder. So what is your answer regarding DPT? So for that, you need to know two answers. Can DPT cause seizures? Can DPT cause or worsen a progressive neurological disease? Yes, DPT can cause seizure. We all know. And the incidence of seizure following DPT is more with whole cell pertussis than SLR pertussis. But whole cell pertussis gives uh, more protection against prevention of infection and longer duration of protection. So higher incidence of seizure probably is because of the higher incidence of fever also. But you should also know that there is no evidence that vaccination before or after disease onset affect the outcome in case of a neuroregressive disorder. What does that mean? If you're giving a DPT, you may have precipitated or you may have witnessed the first seizure after the DPT. But even if you had not given the DPT, the disease course ha would have been the same. So DPT neither precipitates a disease onset nor worsens a disease. But vaccination, so vaccination should not be withheld from children with neurological disease. But if it is a child with a progressive neurological disease, including infantile spasm, in fact, um, uh, you can continue with vaccination if or after you have identified the disease, confirmed the disease, treatment regimen has been established, prognosis explained and condition stabilized. Then you would continue with DPT. I hope that is clear and repeat once again. If you have a child with progressive neurological disease for which your diagnosis is still not confirmed and you are only evaluating the child, you would not give the DPT because you don't want the patient to to uh, say, uh, to put the blame on DPT vaccine for the developmental regression. So that is why you will not give DPT till you have confirmed the diagnosis, prognosis has been ex explained and treatment regime has been established. After that, you would definitely go ahead and give a DPT vaccine because it is important for them to have protection against diphtheria, pertussis and tetanus. So what are the real contraindications? In fact, the real contraindications are only two. That is anaphylaxis to a previous dose of DPT and encephalopathy within seven days of DPT for which no other cause is found. So that are the two contraindications. Rest, everything is a precaution. If you feel that the benefit outweighs the risk, the vaccine should be given. Now coming to the next scenario, this is a 10-year-old child with acute leukemia admitted with disseminated varicella syndrome. She had severe pneumonia, shock, multi-organ failure. Thankfully, she survived, but it's not always the same. There are a lot of patients with leukemia. Once they get varicella, they succumb to disseminated varicella syndrome. It's a lethal disease as far as immunocompromised children are considered. So your question is, how could you have prevented this disease? And what is the immunization recommendation for patients on chemotherapy? The answer would be for you to prevent this disease, one is you have to prevent exposure. You could have prevented an exposure. And the next is what could you do after an exposure has happened? Remember, most of the varicella cases, more than 90% is household contact from whom, unfortunately, the child gets the vaccine. So that is why it is very, very important every time you have an immunosuppressed in your family, all the family members should take a varicella vaccine and an MMR vaccine to pre prevent getting infections themselves and not acting as a carrier for the poor patient. So vaccination of contacts is very, very important. What can you do if the patient has already had an exposure to varicella? You can give varicella zoster immunoglobulin, but unfortunately that is not freely available. You can give IVIG 400 mg per kg may be given. It's not foolproof, but may be given. 
The other thing that you can do is acyclovir 80 mg per kg per day may be offered from day 7 for 7 to 10 days. And it is also said that you can suspend the chemotherapy for 21 days if possible, because incubation period for varicella is close to 21 days. So for 21 days, you can, if possible, suspend the chemo and then restart the chemo. If you have a cancer institute uh, nearby or are working in a cancer institute, you would know uh, how devastating it can be if the hospital faces a varicella outbreak, because all these interventions are only partially effective. So what are the recommendations as far as patients with on chemotherapy are considered? Avoid live vaccines during chemotherapy. And in fact, vaccinate six months after chemotherapy. That is what the ACVIP says. But CDC says that you can give live vaccine three months after uh, stop of chemotherapy if immune reconstitution has happened. But if the regimen also included uh, rituximab, that is anti-V cell antibody, then definitely after six months only, you should give a live vaccine. Any killed vaccine that is received during chemotherapy needs to be repeated later. So which is the killed vaccine that you're going to give for a patient on chemotherapy? The only vaccine that is recommended to be given even while on the chemotherapy is influenza vaccine. And that is in fact, pneumococcal and HIP are also recommended in certain situations if not previously vaccinated, but the efficacy would be limited. So influenza is definitely in indicated and that is usually should be given between chemotherapy cycles or at least two weeks before the next chemotherapy happens. So influenza is one vaccine that is recommended for children on chemotherapy. Then as I already said, vaccinate close contacts and booster doses of childhood vaccines may be offered six months after stopping chemotherapy. That is also one additional recommendation. Now coming to another scenario, four month old child is brought with no BCG scar. So this is a situation you can have in OSCE. This is a situation you can have in your case presentation. The child does not have a BCG scar. The question comes up, what does BCG scar mean? Till what age can BCG be given? What do, will you do if there is no scar? What is a trained immunity? A term that has been coming to use after the COVID outbreak. And the role of scar in non-specific effects of BCG and write to newer BCG vaccines under phase three trial. So uh, what is, uh, so first of all, you need to know what does a BCG scar mean? A BCG scar only means it is an evidence that you have taken the vaccine. It does not, uh, it does not mean anything else. It is an evidence that you have taken the vaccine. Till what age BCG can be given? According to national schedule, it is one year. According to IAP, it is five years. Does that mean that nobody gets um, a TB tuberculosis after one year and five years? No, that is not the reason. The reason why it is not recommended beyond a particular age is because India is considered endemic for tuberculosis and you would have been already exposed to the disease by that time. And that itself may protect you against a severe disease. And that is why BCG is recommended till one year by NIS and till five years by uh, IAP. So what if there is no scar? If you have a documented evidence that the child has received the BCG vaccine, there is no need to repeat the BCG. But if the patient has no scar and the patient is not sure that the vaccine has been taken, then it can be repeated once. And usually you will call a baby as not having a scar only at six months of age because scar may be formed a little uh, later also. Now coming to what is a trained immunity? So what we need to know that after a primary infection or vaccination, you have your primary immu innate immune response that gets stimulated. But this innate immune response itself undergoes epigenetic reprogramming, which gives you a trained innate response. And that is what is known as the uh, your primary training. So you should what so you should what is the difference between a trained immunity and the adaptive immunity? Adaptive immunity, you are not talking about the innate immunity cells. Here you're talking about the innate immunity cells, your macrophages, your natural killer cells, the primary um, antigen presenting cells, which are getting trained in such a way that when an infection with some other organisms happen, also your body. Uh, because of the epigenetic reprogramming, it responds better. So that is what uh, many people had were doing studies regarding BCG, regarding OPV, regarding MMR in response to COVID vaccine. That is, it was found that babies or children or people who had received these vaccines um, earlier were getting less severe infections. So it's not completely proved, but that is the concept that is trained innate response. 
So what is the non-specific effect of BCG? It has been found that BCG has a heterologous protection against certain respiratory infection. Sepsis caused by viruses like herpes and influenza seems to be less in babies who have received BCG. Similarly, Shigella, malaria, also the incidence seems to be less. And there is also a reduced neonatal mortality in low birth weight babies by 48%. So it's just some of the studies telling that BCG has non-specific effects. That is when you're giving BCG, it is not only protecting the baby against the tuberculosis, but it is also giving some trained innate immunity. Now, what is the importance of scar? The non-specific effects of BCG are greater when there is a scar. So if somebody has received a BCG and also has a scar, the non-specific effect seems to be better. But revaccination leads to little or no extra protection against tuberculosis, but may increase the non-specific effects. Documented vaccination, no need to repeat, even if scar is not there. So just know the two terms. That is, even if you don't have a scar, if you have a documented uh, um, this thing that you have received the vaccine, no need to repeat. The second, there are certain non-specific effects for BCG, which is mainly related to trained primary immunity, which protects you against unrelated viruses, bacteria, as well as protozoa. Now, what are the new uh, phase vaccines in phase three? There are several vaccines like the VPM-1002. What is interesting regarding the newer vaccines is that these vaccines are having, in fact, immunotherapeutic role, as well as prevention of infection in the household contact and also recurrence in preventing recurrence in previously cured people. So newer vaccines are just not looking at primary prevention. It is also looking at the secondary prevention of tuberculosis. Now uh, coming to something very simple before we wind up. So uh, where would you place the vaccine? You have six vaccines in front of you. OPV, measles, rotavirus, JE, Pentavac, and hepatitis B. And you have one um, your ice pack, where would you place all these three vaccines? So you need to know that uh, if for you that OPV and MMR or measles need to be placed on the well on the top of an ice pack. Whereas your JE and rotavirus are also live vaccines. They should be kept on the surface of the ice pack. Whereas Pentavac and hepatitis B are T-series vaccine. T-series vaccines are not are damaged by heat much, they are damaged by freezing. So T-series vaccine should never be kept on top of an ice pack. That brings to another point, what is a conditioned ice pack? A conditioned ice pack is whenever you are taking a freezer fresh ice pack, you will never keep any vaccine on top of a freezer fresh ice pack, um, ice pack including the ice packs used in the vaccine carrier. You will always keep the vaccine outside for sufficient time when you see that water droplets are appearing on surface of the ice pack or when you take and um, move it, you're able to hear a clicking sound. That means water has started melting inside. Then you assume that the core temperature is close to zero degrees centigrade and only those ice packs are used during an immunization schedule or during a uh, vaccination transport. So we understood the importance of ice pack, the importance of conditioning an ice pack, and the importance of keeping different vaccine at different sites. So that is also very, very important. Now, the last question before we wind up, you have a six month old baby with five vaccines to be given. So how would you administer vaccine? Is there a science behind administration of vaccine? A small baby, how would you plan? So you should know that in fact, there is a guideline from MOH to how to really give this vaccine. The first vaccine that you give is OPV because it is sweet. The next one is the rota, which is either bland or either or, or slightly bitter. And then you have the fractional dose of IPV, which is not that painful, followed by PCV. And it is pentavac or DPT is given the last. So understood, when you're giving a vaccine virus, you always vaccine vaccination to a baby. When you're giving multiple doses, always try to give the most um, least painful and the most friendly vaccines first and keep the most painful vaccines for the end. And before I conclude, there is one last question which you can answer. The question is, what is RTS-S vaccine? This is one of the latest recommendations by WHO. It is a recombinant vaccine. Uh, many doses, millions of doses, or close to 2 million doses have already been given. It can be given to babies more than five months of age. 
and that particular disease, it has shown a vaccine efficacy of decreasing the mortality by 30 percentage. So can anyone tell me which is the latest vaccine being recommended for children by WHO? Thank you. Any answers to the last question? Yeah, yeah very good. So that is very good. So that is you have Sneha, Shalini, and Nidhi have answered. So that is the malaria vaccine, which has been latest, uh, Moscorex. Very good. So that is the vaccine which has been recommended by WHO. So if you get a malaria case, that would be another question that can be asked. So you need to know. And RTSS means it's a recombinant one. It is recombinant to HBSH surface antigen. That is why RTS with an S is there. Any okay. doubts you want to ask? Yeah, there is a question on repeat of uh, importance of absence of PCG scarring. Okay. Uh, so be, as I see, we, for that question to be answered, we need to know that why some patients don't have a BCG scar. So remember, if instead of BCG is an intradermal vaccine, so if accidentally you give the vaccine subcutaneously, you will have vaccine protection, but you will not have a scar. Similarly, if uh, the there is a deficiency of leukocyte migration inhibiting factor also, you will have the protection, but you will not have a scar. So that is why even when you don't have a scar, it does not mean that you are not protected against the disease. So the recommendation is if you have taken BCG and there is a documented evidence that BCG has been taken, there is no need to repeat the BCG vaccine. The other thing I said is non-specific um, important non-specific um, effects of BCG seems to be better in patients with scar than without a scar. But you are taking BCG vaccine not for the non-specific effects. You are taking BCG vaccine for the specific effect to prevent severe forms of tuberculosis. Um, there is one more question, madam, on how long is the pre-exposure prophylaxis protective for rabies? Okay, pre-exposure prophylaxis, protective for rabies. I think that question would come for post-exposure prophylaxis also, right? So whenever you're taking, what would you? So pre-exposure prophylaxis, there is no limit. So anytime you have taken a pre-exposure prophylaxis, whenever you get a re-exposure, you would be taking 0-3. It's mainly because uh, why I say so is that you are for a pre-exposure now, if you're taking three doses, then you are protected for the next three months and you need to take 0-3 only after that. But if you're taking just two doses, the newest regimen, definitely you have to take the 0-3 booster doses also. I hope I haven't confused. Post After you have taken a complete post-exposure prophylaxis, you are protected for three months. You need to vaccinate only after three months. The same thing applies for pre-exposure prophylaxis also. But if you have given, instead of three doses, you have gone to the newest schedule of just giving two doses, I would say, please give 0-3. Maximum dose of monoclonal rabies antibodies? And there is, in fact, uh, there is no maximum dose. Eh? You, because monoclonal antibodies, the two doses come as different. One is 3.33 IU per kg, one is 20 IU per kg. And both things you have, the 3.33 one is the one uh, came first. And you have 100 IU. Uh, this um, vial is available, but there is no upper limit. It is adult also, it is per kg dose. So don't go for the upper limit. Ashra, you have some question. What is that you have asked? In a PID case, without In a PID in a case, PID. without a BCG scar, what you do? I think that is the question, right? Primary immunodeficiency, whether you would give a BCG or not. So here we have to understand is that BCG vaccine uh, if the immunodeficiency is proven, if you have already confirmed skid, you're not supposed to give. If your previous child is having a skid, you have a baby being conceived the next time. Unless you rule out skid, you're not going to give her this thing. Same thing applies for HIV also. Unfortunately, I haven't covered HIV. HIV, you need to know that in case of HIV, in India, we still continue to give BCG for all babies born to HIV positive mothers. But in case the baby does not receive the BCG at birth and subsequently HIV is confirmed, please do not give BCG vaccine because WHO characteristically says that uh, HIV confirmed the patients should not receive a BCG vaccine. It's a live vaccine. So severe immunodeficiency, it will not be indicated, especially T cell immunodeficiency. So BCG is given intradermal MMR and subcutaneous, though they are live are given uh, subcutaneous is the question. 
Okay, I think, uh, so we haven't covered wa- what does root of vaccination means, right? So we need to know that there are certain vaccines which are given subcutaneously, certain vaccines which are given IM and certain vaccines given intraderm. Wa- what does the roots have regarding vaccine? We need to know that when you are giving a vaccine in the intradermal route, dermis has the maximum number of antigen presenting cells. There are a lot of dendritic cells. That is why you are eliciting a good immune response even by giving one fifth of the dose. So that is the concept of using fractional dose of IPV, your intradermal dose of rabies, because you smaller dose, you are eliciting a very good immune response. Now, what is regarding subcutaneous and IM? We need to understand that the antigen presenting cells are least in the subcutaneous plane. But unfortunately, that is the most um, least painful route of administration of the vaccine. So that is why live vaccines are usually given in the subcutaneous plane. That is, for example, your MMR, your varicella, because live vaccine, the antigen dose is very small. It has to multiply in your body, simulate a natural infection, and then only the protection happens. So once it multiplies in the body, it is spreading to the whole of your body. So the root doesn't have a difference. Whether you give sub-Q or IM, the vaccine would be equally effective. I hope that point is clear. Vaccines which are recommended to be given in the subcutaneous plane, if they are uh, accidentally given intramuscular, also vaccine is equally effective. Now coming to the third scenario, that is vaccines which are recommended in the intramuscular plane. That is your DPT vaccine, which is recommended, or hepatitis B, which are recommended in the intramuscular plane. If those vaccines are given in the subcutaneous plane, they are considered invalid because this here, uh, it is just um, local immunity from where you are getting an immune response and you need to have a very good immune response. For that, you have to give it in from us. So that is why any vaccine given in the gluteal region is considered invalid. Regarding BCG, why is it that it is given in the intradermal plane? I think Akhil meant that. The reason is BCG, once it is administered, you know that it gets localized there. If the vaccine virus multiplies, it uh, then forms a, a granuloma and then it ruptures and then it heals. So for all that to happen, it will happen only if it is in the intradermal plane. If you go ahead and give a subcutaneous plane, the chance of having a BCG lymphadenitis would be more. The chance of having a deep-seated access will also. So even if you give an IEM BCG, that has also happened that mistakenly, instead of giving uh, hepatitis B, 0.5 ml of BCG was given IM. So what will happen? You will have a deep-seated granuloma formation. It cannot rupture, heal. So that is why it is given in the intradermal plane. Thank you, madam. I think uh, those were the questions. And comprehensively, madam has covered all the recent uh, advances and probable OSCE and the virus questions uh, for all the PG students. Any more doubts? That's it, ma'am. Even on uh, YouTube as well as those. YouTube, that, that is all. Right. Thank you so much, Shija, ma'am. We would like to have you more, many more sessions on uh, Vitality. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so much. And okay. thank you, participants as well, for coming for the session. Thank you. Yeah.